Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Educator live stream. Woo! Hey. Happy 2021. Happy 2021. Today, we've got a live stream yeah. called Unreal Engine's Hour of Code, Lesson Plans, and Content Pack. And for those of you who are surprised that we're having a live stream on Tuesday, uh, we typically had this live stream on Fridays and uh, back in 2020, so very long ago. Um, we had made an announcement that we were moving it to Tuesday. So the, for those of you who are surprised that we we're having a live stream on Tuesday, um, don't worry. The Thursday stream will still happen as it usually the Inside Unreal stream with Victor is going to continue to happen as it usually does. But we are having a, a very uh, first special live stream on Tuesdays. And as usual, we have our co-host, Tom Shannon, up on the top Hello, corner. everybody. And Mark Flanagan. In the other top corner, and we've got our special guest today, which is Seven Siegel, down in the bottom. Hey, hey. And Seven is joining us because he has uh, been a special contributor and producer to the Hour of Code content, which is today's topic. Uh, and today we're really going to do a deep dive into the Hour of Code content and something that, uh, for those of you who have been taking a look at uh, the blogs on Unreal Engine, uh, as well as the marketplace, there's been a new content pack that has been released, which has been an hour of code content pack, but also new lesson plans that were released for the hour of code that we really wanted to dig into today because it's a, a really cool new set of content as well as lesson plans uh, that for those of you who teach with Unreal, learn with Unreal, um, and have been using, for instance, a lot of third-person uh, templates to teach from, to learn from, uh, there's new stuff. There's new stuff to work with. So today what we're going to do, uh, Tom and Mark have been working with this content. We wanted to dig into it and sort of look into a lot of this really uh, cool new content from Epic Games and some of the contributors uh, and really sort of uh, understand what it is, uh, what comes with this content pack, how you might be able to utilize it. And both Mark, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Tom and Seven have built some content with it, so you can sort of take a look at how some of this stuff can be utilized. And then Mark's also going to open up the source content, which is coming in a, a pack that will be available on the marketplace in the coming weeks or so, um, which is something that I don't think we've done very much of, have we, gentlemen? Uh, really release a lot of the source content, uh, which I think is going to be really exciting. So Today's stream is really going to be focused on looking at this really exciting stuff. But before we get into that, um, let's uh, have you, Seven, introduce yourself a little bit and tell everyone a little bit more about yourself and uh, the kind of work that you've been doing here with us at Epic and, and a little bit more about the Hour of Code as a whole and uh, kind of what all this cool stuff's all about. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so thank you for having me. Uh, it's great to be here for the second time. Uh, long time watcher, second time caller. Uh, <laughs> so I've been, you know, I've been working on the education team uh, for a bit now, quite a while, over a year. Um, and I've been working with students and I've been taking on, you know, a lot of these other various projects because there's, there's just so much in the education space uh, with Unreal Engine and everything Epic does. And so um, we had kind of, two simultaneous thoughts that, that beautifully came together. One was um, the Hour of Code is an awesome event that happens every year in December um, during Computer Science Education Week. And the goal is really just to demystify coding for students, just in any kind of way, just code um, anything, anywhere. And many, many organizations participate in our code by creating their own lessons. And many, many schools, I think they, you know, I think they have over 10 million teachers or that have signed up. Um, or maybe one, sorry, 1.5 million teachers that have signed up wow. uh, throughout their time uh, doing our code. And, um, and so we figured, well, you know, we should definitely be a part of this, give students i mean games is just such a like exciting thing you know for for kids and students in stem learning and so we we went for it and made this hour of code project and the goal being that it's five lessons uh each one each lesson will um 
if you're a uh, if, if you've got smart kids it might even be less than an hour but definitely won't take you more than a whole hour for each one and you go through a a level that we created and by building you you build the level out and you learn parts of unreal engine and then coding in general through building the level and so that was the hour of code and then we also decided we should make some cool assets as much as the unreal mannequin looks cool the gray template gets a little boring compared to <laughs> i mean the excitement of like everything video games i don't know what you mean what do you mean the gray level and the, the mannequin <laughs> is boring <laughs> i mean he's what you I, say about manny <laughs> <laughs> oh boy i'm gonna get attacked on the internet i'm sure um but it, it's you know it, compared to uh here create a cube and we'll pretend this is a power up what if we just made a power up? what if we just made like cool looking characters and so we made the asset kit and then we said oh we have this great power of code project coming up you know what let's combine it let's use let's use the asset kit we're making for educators to use for our own education purposes if it's not good enough for us to use it I, we shouldn't give it out so yeah. Sure. So the idea, I mean, if I'm, you know, just to paraphrase a little bit is to, uh, yes. is to take something that, you know, I mean, I think a lot of people on the stream use Unreal on a regular basis. I know that for a fact, you know, we've got a lot of regular viewers on the stream. Uh, many of them I know have kids or, or many of them have friends who want to jump into Unreal, but they're like, you know, we see it all the time, but where do we start? Right. So uh, I know I've got friends who are like, you know, can you take me through some of it? So in many ways, this is a great way to have people jump in and go, well, if you don't want to jump into the deep end, let's bring you into the shallow end, right? So in some ways, it's yeah. like, let's open up this level. Let's try a couple things, right? Without necessarily having to uh, immediately jump into the deep end of Unreal. Would that be a, a good way of sort of saying it? Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's, the content was built um, we, you know, worked with teachers, like people actively working in the classroom. And so this content's built to work for, uh, you know, high schoolers, even middle schoolers to take them through Unreal Engine. And if you're really scared of starting with Unreal Engine as an adult, uh, even using the content just to, you know, dip your toe in the water, um, it's great and short and easy and fun. Slam dunk all around. Now, Tom, you were saying that <laughs> over uh, the holidays, you and even some of your family members participated and, and you took somebody through it and and, uh, and you're an experienced tech artist and, and you had some family members just give it a shot, right? Like, Right. And, you know, I, I teach Unreal a lot, so it was kind of interesting for me to get to back off the reins a bit and I just followed it. Uh, you know, I've just step by step and uh we got through it and we had an absolute blast uh and my son has been so inspired he's now working on his own game uh and of course it's it's he wants it to be the hardest rogue like bullet <laughs> hell top down randomly generated <laughs> thing ever um because him and his friends just love the hardest games on earth so He's, he's busily working on creating the hardest game anyone's ever made. Um, and I, I, I hope he can do it because then I can retire. Uh, so. <laughs> oh, so he's making Fortnite. Too. So the, these Living guides the have set him off. And um, the, these guides are my retirement plan, Seven. No pressure whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, you know, we went through, they were so much fun and so... Uh, so straightforward and and well thought out uh you know they're obviously designed by educators um the the writing is really well written it's very clear all of the images it just it all fits together you know that often you'll you'll try a tutorial or whatever and especially with kids you know and then it's kind of high pressure for me to be like okay i'm, I'm gonna get you to use our application and it better not be the worst thing you've ever done um, cause you know, I have to eat dinner with you every day. And if you're like, Shh, I don't like your stuff, 
That's not going to be good. Um, and it was great. And uh, yeah, the the assets and the the guide and everything click together so well. And yeah, I agree. It, even for adults that want to try out some game development and don't want to have to go to a game school, and they've got you know an hour or two to get set up and and go through it, they they will learn a ton and. You know, they they will you'll you'll get through it. Absolutely. Sure. Well, you know, there's already some people in the stream asking about, you know, gaining access and what is it and, and uh, uh, a little bit more of that stuff. So, you know, can I jump over to the blog real quick and, and share with them? Or do you want do you have that up seven? Uh, you want to share that mm-hmm. stuff? Oh, well, you said you have the you have the blog up. Yeah. Here, can, let me let I me pop over. To. So. If you guys uh, want to find out more about this content and uh, just get some general high level, uh, and feel free to speak over uh, and share more information that I miss, Seven. But if you mm-hmm. if you go to unrealengine.com, there's a blog about uh, learn how to code with Unreal Engine um, that was written by Seven. So you can go in here and and just gain some information about the Hour of Code website. Now, I don't know, Seven, is this... This is is done, right? Is that correct? Oh yeah, this yeah, is this... done and out there. Um, and even an, an easier way to access it all as well, if you want, uh, in the marketplace. Yeah. So... If you go to the Epic Games content uh, section of the marketplace, you'll see right there is the Unreal Engine Hour Code Project. Right. And in the description of the project, we'll bring you right to the lesson plan. Great. Right. Well, so that's all kind of. Right. So I've got that up here. So you can go to the marketplace and you'll see it right there and you can download the project work. And then right here is the lesson plan. So if you click on that, it'll take you to the lesson plans and you'll have the lesson plans here, uh, which are PDF files uh, uh, that that work through this material. Right. So there's the actual PDF uh, project. So if you click on that, it takes you to uh, build your first 3D game, uh, learn collision detection with Unreal Engine, uh, and then there's the actual lesson plan and the student guide, and then there's the teacher's guide. So if you, I'm not sure how to, to teach with it, you know, do you want to uh, talk a little bit about yeah, the I teacher's can, guide? Here. Yeah, yeah. So the um, uh, the three the three things that are in each lesson are a lesson plan, a student guide, and and a teacher guide. And the um, student guide is for if you just want to give it to someone uh, and have them kind of do it at their pace um, without needing a teacher, uh, they can go through it. Uh, and it's, it's fairly, you know, it's easy. It's an easy read with lots of pictures. Uh, and so we made sure to include just a student guide for if someone wanted to self-paced do it. The teacher guide is the student guide, but with extra notes for if you are leading someone through it. So parts that we found during testing where students might get caught up or, or parts that might be a little confusing, you know, there'll be extra notes to say, hey, watch out for this, or, you know, you can, this leads into a great discussion about this topic. Um, and then the, the lesson plan, that is for, if you're an educator, uh, specifically like a, a school teacher, Um, and you want to bring this to your school, the lesson plan has all the stuff that you would need to convince your principal, convince your administrator. So it's got the ISTE standards, it's got rubric, um, it's got discussion questions, everything to really easily just show, hey, this is some great learning. Um, That's there for teachers as well. Great. And there's some questions about, you know, uh, is there C++ and blueprints involved? You know, what are, what are the specifics of the lessons? Uh, can you get into some yeah. of that stuff? Yeah. Yeah. So the, the lessons kind of touch on a bunch of various pieces of Unreal as, um, as everyone on the stream, and I'm sure all of the viewers know, like, any one piece of Unreal, you could just have five lessons on and they could be way longer than one hour each. Uh, and so the, right. the goal here was to really, really just give a high level smattering. Uh, and so as we said, like to start, you know, where it, it talks about collision detection and um, and you kind of just are placing actors in static meshes into the space 
uh, simple simple building. Uh, and then uh, from there, there's there's many different small aspects about power ups, uh, collectibles, and um, some blueprint like some bits of blueprint in the end to get students to kind of understand the the next level, the next step of okay, now you can you know play stuff in. Let's talk about modifying a little bit of this. Um, it does not dive into C plus plus. Right. Um, I will say that because well, C plus plus is uh, a little bit more of the deep end, children. right? So that's a little bit more of the deep. But would it be fair to say that uh, you know the the content is built in a way to help people be more successful than to fail faster? Uh, you know, yes. Would that be a, a fair yeah, assumption? Yeah, uh, definitely. Um, uh, there's a lot of people when they teach games, they teach it from this perspective of. Okay, boom, here's here's the engine. Go for it, make something. <laughs> and a lot of times that ends up with people overscoping, right? They, they, you know, especially students, right? I want to make a battle royale, but with, with crafting and, and blocks and, uh, and yeah, too much. Um, and, and then they end up kind of faltering. And the hour of code lessons really set young people up for a quick win. Like they'll feel cool, even if it's just throwing static meshes into the world. We design the world for it to all fit in theme. You know, we have floating islands in the sky so that if you just throw an island of like a floating island in there, it doesn't look at perfectly place. integrated. <laughs> with yeah. Sky. Yeah. Even <laughs> So it, the goal was to make it really, really simple and feel good on a like very yeah. quick win. Yeah. Yeah. Based on successes, you know, I think that uh, uh, we've traveled around and visited many academic institutions, and this idea of fail fast, fail frequently is is a, an actual mantra of many instructors, whereas uh, it, it isn't always the most effective way of making someone feel powerful. Um, maybe later, uh, but, you know, initially, it, it can certainly scare the bejesus out of a lot of people. So um, maybe if you want to, uh, Get you, you know, for those of you of who have children, I know that if I let my children fail frequently, they'll be like, "Thanks, Dad. I'm, we're going to go over here and and uh, jump on social media or YouTube, and uh, we'll see you later." You know, uh, so actually having them succeed can uh, sometimes be okay too, right? And so I think maybe that's a uh, another approach that uh, was chosen. Yeah. Absolutely. And we're, we're super pleased how it's come out. We've just seen great reviews so far. Um, and that's feels good. Feels good. Well, what if I pop back over to the marketplace and we talked about what's included in the content? Because we're going to take a look at it. Uh, would that be good? Yeah. Let me jump back over uh, here. And so if we look back here at the actual content in the marketplace, so you'll see that there are uh, 72 unique meshes in the content pack, uh, 98 materials and material instances, 128 textures, 21 blueprints that actually ship with the content. Now, um, this is a particular content pack that is associated with Hour of Code. Is Are there more plans to this content? You know, can you talk a little bit more about what uh what's to be expected here like uh is this all that's yeah. coming or you know is there i know that there's ideas about source content as well like what what's the big picture yeah so uh as mentioned you know we we wanted to create something uh cool for educators and for students alike to learn with um if you are part of the uh group of people that are bored of the mannequin my apologies to the you others. You really uh, don't like Manny, huh? <laughs> uh, but uh, the, um, the, the goal here was to actually make this asset kit that was really, really modular in a lot of different ways. And so the, the most obvious modularity of it is the actual building parts, the walls, the floors, the roofs. Um, are all are all modular. Mm -hmm. You can very easily just 
take a wall and then clone it and then clone it and then clone it and then build it around. And of course, you know, merge your static meshes. So you don't have a thousand actors in your scene, but uh, you can really easily make a building uh, that looks good. You know, you got windows, you've got floors, and there's um, various you know extra little bits that you can add to make it uh, make it a bit fancy. Uh, and you can even actually see in the in the hour of code lessons some of the small um, ingenuity that we did uh, when it comes to game development. Sometimes you have to uh, be, uh, you know, massage pieces to, to work for you. And so you can see in there, there are some crates that we built that are actually just the floor uh, six times. And it looks like a wooden crate, but it's really just, you know, if you look at it, it's just the floor six times. Um, but st so stuff like that uh, is there for, is there within the kit. Uh, so you, you have modular building pieces, you have collectibles, you have power-ups, as I mentioned, the floating islands, and um, a lot of the um, objects in there, we have, uh, some, some cubes, spheres, are tintable. The materials mm -hmm. were specifically built to be easily tintable so that you can have you know uh, many different power ups, many different collectibles, uh, that with just simple color tweaks uh, for the purposes of you know for the purposes of learning, uh, as well as just a, a fully animated character with um, animations that are um, not specific. What they like, we built these animations to be used for a lot of different things whether it's like turning off and on a switch or moving pieces. Uh, the, anim the goal of the animation was to be vague so that it could fit a lot of different learning. So you're not gonna have a lot of specific like niches that you're gonna have to put your learning content into. Uh, all of this was built with modularity in mind. So out of those 21 uh, blueprints, I, pr I would presume that X number of them are animation blueprints and blend spaces and uh, state machines and so forth. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So we've got animation blueprints, state machines. Um, we have uh, power up in there, uh, a lever and a button. Um, Pick up. You know, button with a nice up and down. Um, yeah. And we have a, a really nice wind effect. That's like a little Niagara wind effect that's hidden in there if you want to jump into Niagara. So dissecting those is a good lesson also for uh, teaching how some of that stuff works in an environment or in a gameplay scenario. Yeah, the, um, I have learned uh, the lesson plans are amazing. And in addition, I have learned so much Unreal from just taking in various projects and taking in various assets and just throwing them into the scene. Control Z, like undo is is one of my best friends. You know, I'll just throw it into the scene, look at it, understand what's going on with it, like what the what the static mesh, what the blueprint is like, and then you just as easily take it out. Um, yeah, dissection's a great tool. I mean, so like this content is it's billed currently as hour of code that that ran in December, but clearly it's got a, a much more far reaching implementation uh, implement imp, uh, the I word. Uh, implement, uh, I'm not even going to try it. Yeah. that word, uh, because you, could, if you're a self learner, you could grab this content and of course learn from it. But also if you, uh, teach at, uh, at any college or if you teach at, a uh, at a high school, if you teach, um, on YouTube, you could grab this content and yeah. start doing whatever you want with it. How about if you're making a game, can you make it, can you, if you, can you ship a game with this content? Yes, please, please. It's just uh, basically, content. if you are following the marketplace guidelines, you can use this content. Yes, the only rule is it has to be used in Unreal Engine. Yeah, uh, we like that. And, and that's it. Can be used for commercial projects. It can be used uh, however however you want to do it. Um, please, it's it's for learning. It's for everybody. And you know, we talk about how this project was initially built around educators, but we've seen even internally, people just excited to use the assets and, and, and take them for their own projects. And so uh, please, if you are just a, an Unreal Engine developer that needs uh, some nice 
islands or you want to use the character, like go for it. Uh, and and it's all like you can just right click and migrate into your project. Um, and then the the next step, as as you mentioned, Lewis, in our hope is you know a, a few weeks is to release all of the source assets as well. So all of the models, the animations, the the textures, all of that. So you can get the whole like get the whole learning experience really. And if you want to modify the assets for your needs, um, for your teaching purposes, it's there for you. Which I don't think is something that in my time at Epic, uh, I'm aware that has really been done, which is, you know, we, we've of course focused very intently on Unreal Engine, but, uh, you know, if you're a content creator, how is this stuff made? How are the animations assembled? How, how do we get the normal maps? You know, how do we do all that stuff? Uh, uh, you know, the whole enchilada, if, uh, <laughs> if we can talk about the enchilada on a stream yes. like this. I know it's still early in the year, but we're already talking about Mexican food. Uh, <laughs> it's never yeah. too early to talk about Mexican food. <laughs> oh, not, at all. not at all. Not at all. You know, but the enchilada, it's not even an enchilada. It's like a whole tray of enchilada, really. Like Maybe a burrito. The sequencer enchilada. You've got, you know, character modeling enchilada. There's a lot of enchiladas. And then when people are starting out in Unreal, I think often it can be, you kind of have to, eat a lot of enchiladas before you can even do something simple like changing the color of a ball. Um, uh, when I had, I've taught a lot of people unreal and the first time I showed my daughter, the first thing she asked was how do I change the color of things? And it was like, Ooh, I'm going to have to teach a material. And, and you know, with this, I can just say, okay, just double click here and we'll change that color. Cool. I don't have to teach the whole thing. But it's it's those simple things or um, anywhere that you're trying to teach or learn, having everything else ready so that you can just find that one thing and focus on that one thing and see how it fits in. Because that's really the I think the hardest part of game development is that there's so much going on all at once trying to learn one thing. It it kind of feels like you have to learn a little bit of everything first before you can get to what you're really trying to learn. Um, and so, and having the, having everything all the way from the source files, all the way to it actually implemented and working um, is such a, like, like Lewis said, I can't think of another resource that has that, that entire uh, lifeline uh, for these assets. And it's, it's just so cool to be able to, to dig in anywhere and, and start playing with it, or even to modify it, to be able to make it your own. If you want to go add a bunch of animations to this character, well, you've got the source and you can go do that and make them match up because you've got all the animation files. You don't have to like export out an FBX and do this kind of complicated backwards engineering. <laughs> Uh, and um, a specific note during during the testing, one of the feedback we got from teachers uh, specifically was with the character, uh, the students better be able to modify it uh, to make their, you know, they, they always want to customize their avatar. And so specifically the character itself, um, we made sure it has a number of different elements to its material that are all tintable. So that if you're working with students, and you want to get them excited, first thing you can have them do is just customize their avatar. Give them, you know, give them the clothes, give them the skin, the boots that, uh, that they want to have. Um, and we, we really built this content as well to be um, so nonviolent. You know, there's no, no shooting, no guns, none of that. Um, it's safe for school use, really, uh, right. as well as kind of we, we aimed for it to be genderless in a way. You know, you often see games marketed towards specific audiences, and we just wanted something that just looked both cool and cute, which yeah, I yeah. think we achieved. <laughs> awesome. Well, how about we jump into it? Uh, you've got, you're going to present, uh, you're going to present the project now, Seven. Is that, does that uh, sound like a good time to? to jump in and sort of show everyone what the content is yeah. and 
yeah, uh, absolutely. And give everyone a good overview. The, yeah, let me just open up the level here and uh, share my screen. Um, because I think we've whet their appetites for enchiladas. We might yeah, as well show yeah. the enchilada. Know what I'm having for dinner. Right. Is my screen all up? Yes. Fantastic. So, uh, so as you all can see here in this just basic overview, you can see all of the props. And let's full screen this. Um, you can see all the props that we have, all the various characters and all the animations, and I'll dive in in just a second, but you can see just a brief overview, even these little dust motes. Uh, we have little bits of foliage that can be painted, nice grass, nice clovers here, a little couple flowers, and um, the, the textures are also, by the way, with the grass lined up to work with the top material of the uh, island, so that if you change the material of the island it will change the shading of the grass, um, which is just a, a cool small thing. Um, but yeah, this is this is the little character. You can see I'll run towards all the all the various different uh, materials here. A little shiny logo, those like four slashes you'll see around. Um, the, you know, we got the T-pose around. Here. Oh yeah, the blink. If you just yeah. It's somewhere in here. There yeah. it is. And you can see this button here, you know, actually depresses and goes up. And uh, you can see up in the top the uh, the print string. Um, and then here are just some of the modified uh, modified materials. You can see actually this one, this one started as it was the same color as the sphere. And then I just tried to test it out. And it's really easy, quick and easy, just make something look different. Um, and here's the collectible and the power-ups. Um, these clouds are, oh, I love these clouds. <laughs> uh, just really pleased with yeah, how it all came out. And, and here, are the, here are the animations from, we got the crouching, the crouching idol, crouch walk. Here's the idol, the walk animation, the run, run, jump, just the jump. And then here's the fly in rough winds and then just normal fly. And then here's the uh, uh, flying. It's on a uh, blend space, so when you slow down, you can, as you can see here, uh, it looked like Superman. We definitely based this pose off of Superman with the. You can even see the leg lifted there for anyone who's fans <laughs> of Superman. <laughs> uh, yeah, and the falling, showing the little bit of shirt flipping up, um, and then these are the. These are the kind of generic animations I mentioned. This is the quick interact. The goal being here, you can add a really nice visual effect on it, but you can use it for, you know, if you can magically do a lever from afar or, or push something open or whatnot. And then we have this, this one is loopable. So I'll, I'll do it right here. And this is for if you, you know, want to maneuver something, but you needed a, a long standing animation for a press and hold. Um, and then it stops when you let go. And then finally, this is the celebrate for when, yeah, for when the level's completed. I'm really pleased with how that one turned out. Yeah. And so it's all like all of these various pieces, you can definitely go in and, uh, look, look at how they're built with even the backpack and the, uh, like, and the sleeping bag and how they're connected to the character. And here are the modular pieces. Uh, here's this this gate. This is it locked and closed. So if you need to, you know, literally gate a level, uh, you can use that. And then here is it open. You've got these stairs. We've got uh, wide stairs and just normal stairs. And here are the uh, roof pieces, as mentioned. Being nice with the little bevels and the breaks in them. And, um, and then we have a ramp here and floor pieces. And you can see when it's all kind of put together how it looks. Uh, windows and yeah, you, have, you can have a closed door here, but collision is off for this for the purposes of showcasing. So you can see here's how it looks. And you can even have the little bits of it bleed through um, through the grass and yeah, pick up the panel wraps.
But of course, this one's just for show. <laughs> yeah, that is a, a very brief overview of this kit. You can see off in the distance uh, some of the uh, I was doing some some sequencer stuff for uh, for the marketing purposes, and so you can see the buildings being used in other ways uh, off in the distance. But the great thing about doing photos is that you can take them from a very specific perspective, and then when you move around them, you can see stuff like floating roofs. <laughs> <laughs> hey, what's that? <laughs> Yeah, and here, here are the islands that very easily actually you can build kind of, you can see these islands are, um, if you just kind of push them together, they they maneuver together really well to make it just look like a bigger island um, instead of being a really weird looking. Yeah, scene. that's cool. Yeah. So these are all, as as mentioned, you know, planned for this, this easy level making, easy win kind of stuff and these clouds. <laughs> I want to eat those the clouds. The static mesh as well. I want yeah. to eat them. Awesome. I want to eat the clouds. They look like uh, delicious croissants. Uh, yeah. I'm I was avoiding eating. calling them sky croissants, but since you opened that door, <laughs> they are. Well, they delicious. remind me of, of Monty Python mm -hmm. clouds, too. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Terry Gillum style. They are Terry and Gillum I was, style. I was working on, uh, you, know, you can even see over here. It's kind of, oh no, this is just a cloud. Um, I was working on looking at, here we are. If you modify the uh, texture of the island, you know, can you kind of make it look way more snowy? Nice. And then I was, I was taking the clouds and actually just modified the materials on the clouds and, and tried just, you know, putting them into the island to look as if it, if it really had that snow impact. Um, and all the stuff here that I'm showing you, I just did only in Unreal Engine, right? I didn't, I didn't touch other, uh, other software, um, but and so because that's that's how I roll with these things, and uh, yeah, and and so it's really it's it's fun the various modifications you can do. You can see here this is one of the photos that we took, but this is as I show you as I showed you all like the gates, but then you kind of put them here and then, you know, make this look much more like a. Uh, like a fancy power platform rather than just a bunch of the um, roof tile turned upside down uh, with the doors and that kind of little small bits of ingenuity. This, this little wind stream we have here too. Yeah. Well, there you have it. Uh, you That's know, awesome. Stop sharing. And then you said that everything comes with master materials, so uh, material instances. So uh, you can just basically select an actor, go to its material instance, and start modifying yep. whatever is modifiable yep. on the actor. Yeah, yeah. They have uh, they have master. Uh, we've got master materials set up for the project, and um, uh, and yeah, it's really easy to to just change the various parts of it. Um, whether you're changing just like whole whole parts of it or even just small modifications. Um, really pleased with how easy that is. So um, there's some questions about the frame rate that people are seeing in here. Um, uh, I've typed it out into the chat, but Seven is joining us via Zoom. Um, yeah. So we are limited to what Zoom can provide, which has improved, but is it not has? quite as smooth as you might be used to seeing from your usual Twitch streams. Um, the game assets were designed to run on very low-end hardware, so they are all very uh, low-poly um, and have been tech-arted to make sure that they can run with forward rendering and all of the, the low-end, you know, they work on mobile, they work on VR. Uh, you know, if you're doing, you know, if you're if you're hardware limited, um, this asset pack it's it's small enough to fit on, you know, a flash drive, uh, and it it it'll run on a potato. Hopefully, if you can get Unreal to run, these assets should be just fine. Yeah, Enjoy. yeah. My, my, I, I assure you, it ran flawlessly as I yeah. was going through it. My apologies for the frame rate. No, absolutely. It, I, I checked it out today and it was running well on mine. 
um, again, sort of decent end um, laptop, but you can see from the, the assets how quickly they load and how how small they are, how efficiently they, they've been designed. It will run on pretty much anything. Yeah, I'm, I'm running on a five-year-old graphics card. <gasps> you told me what it was. I won't embarrass you by Thank you. letting Thank everyone you. know what it is. Uh, <laughs> Will it run on an enchilada? Yeah, uh, you know, and it, there's some good questions here. Uh, I, I want to ask you a question real quick, Seven. Are, have we uh, sim shipped this in other languages? Uh, so this content is only available in English right now. Um, all of the uh, so unfortunately, the the lesson plans are currently only available in English. Um, I think we're we're looking into that, um, and I think we're going to be looking more closely at the start of the at around the end of the month uh, as we have someone way more versed in this area coming onto our team. Um, and yeah, uh, but the I mean the project files, if you want to mess around with those, you you don't need to know um, English to mess around with the project files. Good. Yeah, I don't have chat open. So if anyone wants to tell me any chat questions, I'll certainly answer those. I think we've hit many of those up. Now, yep. you had also uh, assembled some other environments. You want to save those for later? You want to show those now with the content? Oh, um, I'll show them now. I'll start because then we can, you know, everyone can ooh and ah, Tom, a uh, second. Uh, <laughs> So I, I wanted to give, uh, let me just pull up the level. I wanted to give an example of, um, of what actually using the assets to, um, well, kit bash, really. As somebody that works just in Unreal Engine, um, I love taking things from the marketplace and throwing them into my projects. Um, but sometimes they... Well, especially when dealing with photorealistic assets, you know, it's hard to make that work. Um, so I ended up just grabbing, I grabbed the low poly kingdom from the Edith Finch set, um, which, so if you've played Edith Finch, it's very amusing seeing these in a totally different light. Um, but if you haven't, don't worry about it. <laughs> which is really awesome because, you know, our marketplace is just chocked full of amazing free content. And so th this idea, mm -hmm. and I think that this really speaks to what we were talking about earlier, which is we've got all this amazing content. And when you start to sort of bringing it all together, you can get some incredibly creative things, especially in the context of teaching, in the context of creating challenges for learners and students in general, where you're like, here's a huge treasure trove of amazing content, go and be creative in Unreal Engine, especially when you've got a character that, you know, has full mobility and blueprints where you can trigger things, right? Yeah, yeah. And so I just, I wanted to see, you know, you can see this is the island here, but I modified the texture, I painted on with the, um, with the foliage tool, uh, you know, try and make it more desert sand looking. Um, and these palm trees, I just pulled pulled straight in, and they they fit they fit the style aesthetic so well, which I'm really pleased about. And you can see some various parts of me just testing things over there, random stuff in the universe. Um, but you know, just just even just throwing these assets in, it really seems to fit. Like looking at these plants, it just looks like they were built for this kit in mind. I want to um, just add really quickly that a little wow, bit later in the too stream, too. Uh, you know, Tom's going to go uh, super crazy tech arty and do some nutty stuff with water and clouds and stuff like that. So, yes, we are going to run the gamut in Unreal Engine as we do. Um, but I think what what is incredible here is the idea of unleashing yourself into the marketplace, and uh, which is what I think many learners love to do, and and the results you can get, especially with content packs uh, of this nature. Yeah. And, and so I wanted to show, you know, here, um, wow. like just going through here, uh, you can see here, these are the wall pieces that I showed uh, with these little hanging banners. And then That's the gorgeous. wall pieces with um, just a, a straight up, just pull of material, just dragged and dropped material. Um, and then 
uh, you know, imagining a boss level of sorts here where this is a combination of like, you know, the, the Edith Finch uh, throne room mixed with the uh, mixed with the asset kit wall pieces and, and ceiling pieces. And uh, here's what I imagine a, yeah, a boss fight here would be. Um, but of course, I didn't have enough time to program a boss fight. So I just put in a good, uh, good dragon. <laughs> and of course the, uh, love the dragon sword in the jar. It's a <laughs> lesser known sword in the stone sword in the jar. Uh, very Shakespearean. Then, yeah, like, and you can see these, I mean, these window pieces uh, are just two gates put together fancily to, with, with a nice window uh, glass oh, material. Nice. Um, yeah, and so it's, it's... If you go back and replay the, the first Gears of War, the amount of liberties those designers took with static mesh assets. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you're only allowed 17 static meshes to build the whole level. <laughs> so <laughs> you gotta make them. Created. Yeah. And and yeah, so the, the goal here, you know, really quickly I threw this together um, just to show that like e even even very quickly you can make it look pretty good. And then you get tricks like um, these banners here that hide the modularity. So you're not just looking at just a, a wall of the same piece over and over again, because um, our brains are very simple. And you do things like put a banner and suddenly it goes, oh, what a, what a whole unique wall. Um, <laughs> it, is, it is pretty amazing. And this is something that uh, you know we've talked about quite a bit on our previously Friday streams. And when we talk to educators, higher ed higher education, academia, et cetera. There's a lot, of, a lot of questions right now about what we should be teaching uh, moving into next gen and how studios are approaching stuff. And, um, you know, I think that for a long time, games have all been built bespoke. Uh, everything in every game was built just for that game, and it was kind of verboten to reuse stuff. You even see it in Cyberpunk. There's people calling out specific trees that were used in The Witcher and are now in Cyberpunk. So, you know, there's people out there that are paying attention, apparently, but the vast majority of people aren't <laughs> at this point. The assets are of such a high quality, and things like PBR, um, you know, they they mean that if I take this rock and put it into some wildly different lighting condition, it's still going to look like I expect it to. Um, and so this like reusability and this idea of leaning on marketplace content and Quixel content and all of this stuff is absolutely part of what you'll be doing in industry anymore is you will be mixing the art that you make with the art that's already been made either by the studio previously or by someone on marketplace or somewhere because, or from the Quixel library, because, you know, at this point to create the amount of content at the level of quality that audiences are expecting, is just probably a bit much for most studios. There are still the, the big epics and EAs and Biowares who will still do everything bespoke, but um, anyone else is like, hmm, should I be doing this? And and if you're teaching right now or learning, you should be. You should be learning this process of taking these disparate pieces of content and making them work because um, it's a lot cheaper to grab something off the marketplace, modify it, make it your own than to start from scratch quite often. I'd be hard pressed to really uh, you know, if I was a super Edith Finch fan and I had played it a lot, I would probably recognize a lot of these, but, um, you know, I don't, <laughs> yeah. and I've played it and I'm not like, oh, there's that stuff. Uh, it's, it's pretty remarkable. Like you said, if you just put a banner over a wall, you're like, there's a new wall. You take that, that banner from Edith Finch and stick it in here. That's a whole new banner. The one thing I think it's, it's nice to do though, is to, um, give attribution so that's always oh, a nice yeah. thing oh, to yeah. say where it comes from mm -hmm, mm -hmm. please everyone watch the credits of any game 
<laughs> there's so many people that work on it. Yep. Yeah. That's a good point. So uh, some of the other cool stuff that we have is uh, I look at some of the upcoming content, uh, which uh, is some of the source content that will become available, uh, which Mark is going to share with us. Uh, Mark, are, are you ready to take yes, a look at I'm some of that? Yes, I'm just ready to do that. Let me just go and So share once again, screen. this content is not currently available on the marketplace, but in, I don't know, a couple weeks or so, it will be a separate content pack that comes available in the marketplace. Um, do you know what this will be called, Seven, or is it going to be called the same, or uh, is it going to be you, called Seven Special Enchilada Sauce? <laughs> What, what, what we're shall still, we call it? We're still going, uh, you know, back and forth on on names, um, just because some people want it more exciting than just asset kit for learning. Um, of course, be, I like my name a lot. Seven special enchilada sauce, I think is. Yeah, we'll have to run that by uh, legal. Uh, <laughs> but, Seven uh, special source sauce. Source sauce. Oh, source sauce seven. Uh, so, but it'll be, I mean, it'll be under Epic Games content and we'll be, you know, announcing it with a, um, uh, with a blog post specifically about it. And so, uh, it'll be easily findable. I assure you of that. We could call it easily findable, but that would be really confusing. Well, we have your Twitter account <laughs> handle and if you're wrong, they'll come looking for you. They will. God, I'm going to get canceled on Twitter because I'm late. <laughs> <laughs> so this is obviously um, a Maya file with some animation in it, um, and the the character the character has been divided up into the different um, the different meshes which we can see here the hat and the various parts which again these are all um, I believe different materials when they've been brought into Unreal as such, You're and correct. then we have and the we, epic rig which is so, yeah. so like seven it makes it easier so to that... actually deal with. Yeah, yeah. You know, we we, and this we is... walked a fine line between performance and ease of learning. Um, I think, you know, the original version of the character had like two or three materials and a lot of stuff was combined with masks. And um, we made the decision instead to split it up so that it, it was a little easier for people to understand. Um, and, you know, having a couple more segments on a character probably isn't going to you know, kill us on performance, but it, it's those sorts of thought processes as the, as we were building the source content that we really thought about. It wasn't, we weren't making it for a game. We were making it for this learning experience. So we kind of made some decisions on things that would be demonstrative of certain things or uh, would help um, help people learn things that we've seen uh, that were challenged, with, et cetera. Well, the good Sorry, news is that, if, you know, by providing material IDs, uh, everything can be brought into Quixel mm -hmm. Mixer, and you can resurface all your meshes with amazing, uh, amazing photo scanned surfaces in Mixer. I shall open up um, one of the other files, which is the um, um, the roof, which you can see the modular elements in that. I wonder didn't... how wild this thing. The would roof, look at, like eight K textures, realistic and. <laughs> <laughs> so again, here's the roof, and we'll just take one of those elements and move it so we can see it more clearly. So these elements can be joined together in various different ways. And again, you can actually bake out the textures um, to lower polygon if you need it. But it, it starts off quite low to, to begin with, so it's hardly going to be necessary. Um, as it stands, it will run on mobile without any stress, I would imagine. I haven't tried running it on mobile, but really shouldn't be a difficult thing to do. So the roof has the various different elements you need to be able to produce um, a roof which has the different junctions and eaves and hips and all those kind of things that we talk about as architects. Um, but the one I like most of the, the whole kit actually are the islands. I think those are cool and they can be repurposed in different ways. Tom has used them differently, which we'll see in a Liberally. Future. Liberally, yes. Um, so those I think are really lovely. And as I said, to me, they remind me of um, the old Roadrunner and Wile E. Coyote kind of um, 
rock designs. So really nice, mm. mm-hmm. um, sort of angular art deco kind of art deco. That's that's a good term for. It. Yeah, they also have that kind of speckly kind of texture yeah. that that reminds the me texture of that, on them actually is very runner. very nice as well. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Acme uh, again, Acme rocks. also a very fine line between. <laughs> By Amazon. Demonstrating PBR and the, the the you know advantages of of Unreal, while also making something that's stylized and cartoony, uh, which I think uh, I think we did a, a really nice job uh, hitting that mark. Uh, it was it was really fun. To they keep on hitting that mark, that out. hitting that mark all the time. I know. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but again, one of the, the great things about this is um, because of the way in which they've been designed, they actually do join together very nicely. You know, it, you can make larger islands out of them by duplicating them, scaling, putting them together. There are three basic island types, and with those, you can actually produce a multitude of different kind of platforms for building a platformer game um, or use them in other ways. The other assets within the game, again, the, the idea of reusing um, the elements you have, whether they're texture elements or whether they're model elements, is really useful for you in terms of discipline to start with. Um, again, it can be quite tricky for people when they start building their first game, they start making their own assets. They will build too many assets. And on average, I would say for first-time game developers, 30% of them won't actually make it into the game you're much better off to make assets which are reusable and just get those in there and polish them and see what you can reuse and only make the last percentage when you need it because it's it's always a bit um, bit sad when you see the things that didn't make it, the ones that fell on the cutting room floor and you think that I could have spent that time polishing the gameplay. So learn how to reuse and repurpose assets is is very, very valuable. Yeah, there's a couple questions. Uh, one uh, about the character being modular, and, and I would presume that you can remove the backpack and you can remove, uh, you know, th- I don't know if you probably could remove the hat or anything like that. Does it appear that that is a, an option? Um, I don't believe you can remove the hat. The the face and head is all all one, but the the backpack is fairly modular. And even in Unreal, there's a, blueprint or an animation node that you can use to to hide that bone and it it essentially just shrinks the bone down to zero to hide yep, anything yeah. that's attached to it um but yeah that that totally works and then there's and a, the, i'm sorry go ahead the, just as a note the skeleton uh we specifically used the uh the manny skeleton for this character so that you can take a whole host of speaking of marketplace content and all that, just other tons of other animations and use them really easily for this character. So the naming convention of the bones are the same as uh, Manny's, uh, the mannequin yeah, skeleton? Yeah, it's the so, same, uh, same skeleton. So what that means is that it, all the animations are retargetable to the mannequin mm-hmm. and then to a host of other animations that are available on the marketplace, um, which is great. Uh, and but easily retargetable. Easily retargetable. Which is, <laughs> we talk which is, about the animation retargeting tool uh, sometimes is more. All right. You already have yeah, a bunch fine. of people at Epic that are going to come is hunting it? you because of your comments on Manny. So <laughs> you better calm down. <laughs> they do know where you live. They know where you uh. live. So that's one. And then the other question was about um, rig management and rig creation. So... Um, you know what? I don't know that we're asking and we're going to find out about uh, the tools that were used to rig it. I think that it's possible that you're just going to get the skeletal mesh with, you know, the skin, uh, the skin weights. Yeah. Um, uh, but it'll be valuable to know that you can bring the FBX file into Unreal Engine and that you can then use the um, the rigging tool inside of Unreal Engine, which is control rig, to then mm-hmm. build a control armature inside of Unreal Engine and uh, and do a tremendous amount of rigging uh, in, I mean, control inside of Unreal Engine because you have this FBX file uh, and bring it into Unreal Engine, put a control armature inside of Unreal Engine. Um, I don't know if there's a way to reverse engineer art, uh, the animation rigging tool, which is a tool that's provided to Maya 
with this skeletal mesh, but it's potential that you could bolt on this skeletal mesh to the art rigging uh, and you could um, bolt it. And that's a, you know, you, that's a term, yeah, you, you know, bolt, called bolting could, a rig. We have, we have a skinned mesh here and we could actually just um, bolt, rig something in that will yeah. allow you to um, control that, that skinned um, skeleton. So yeah, that, that would be feasible. You'd have to, I, I know you can go out and get some mel scripts that allow you to bolt mesh or uh, yep. bones to another existing rig, but because it's named the same, you could probably even transfer the rig. Uh, there's quite there's possibly all kinds of mel scripts and Python scripts that allow you to transfer yep. bones and bone influences and that sort of stuff. I, so I know quite a lot of people in terms of rigging who actually like to separate their animation rig yeah. from their um, skinning rig yeah. as well. So it's it completely doable. But a good idea. It, it would take yep. some work on your part. Uh, to do that, I know that when I was rigging, you could. I had some tools that did that stuff, um, and it was not a big deal. Mm -hmm. uh, Shall I give control back? Is uh, is there life size Manny, uh, mm -hmm. which has uh, been made yet? Life size. I think a like a real life recreation. Cut, cardboard cutout. <laughs> Cosplay for next mm. year's oh, Halloween. Oh yeah, that yeah. would be cool. Um, I don't know. And and if there hasn't, why? Yeah, why? It's it's a good question. Question. Well, well, there's also it. that that what the Gears of War character at at HQ. That's like, yep. I mean, that's way more than life size. That thing is like like 30 feet tall or something 40 feet tall yeah i have actually for me there's a two-story uh, uh unreal tournament character at epic mm. that's a cool one just this week i actually got um a, a friend of mine who got in touch thanking me for the fact that we actually have a female mannequin now for the first time as well um so yeah. so naming i'm not sure what um what the name should be if anybody has any ideas mm. do we have a name for Manny is a name for all people. Like I've met, yeah. I've met mankind. Women and men, men. <laughs> yeah. And men. Um, Could it be Manny yeah. and War Manny? <laughs> no. Don't know. Don't know. <laughs> I don't know. But yeah. Um, so very nice character and. Okay. Yeah, oh, I, I think yeah, there's, there's a spelling enough thing, you can actually yes. do with this case. In the chat here, uh, Calvin says, Manny with an I and Manny with an I. Is... <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's pull it back, shall we? <laughs> <laughs> Tom, uh, would you like to share some uh, cool stuff that you're uh, yes, experimenting sure, with absolutely. before we completely go off the rails? All of this weird, broken stuff I'm playing with here. So, hi everyone. Um, awesome stuff. So uh, this, I've been helping Seven with this pack uh, and have been so excited that she couldn't keep me away from the, the thing. <laughs> this, this is like, I've been using Manny for far too long um, and having, having some assets that are built um, well uh, for current kind of next gen sort of thought processes um, that aren't overwrought maybe some of epic's content might be more difficult to parse than other content so looking at the paragon stuff maybe um so you know it's it's always been a struggle to find some really high quality content that was um you know up to up to our standards but didn't go absolutely crazy with what we do because we're really good at using unreal and so when we use it we use it kind of at the level we do so um, it can be hard to learn from that stuff and to build learning content with it, or even just to use it outside of what it was intended for. So I've been super excited about this. And one of the things I love as a tech artist is taking really good art from really good artists and doing fun stuff with it. Um, cause I'm not the best modeler and sculptor and all of that. I can, but if I can get my hands on something someone else has done, I'm totally going to use that. Um, and this is just what I've been waiting for for a long time. And so um, I guess I'll share my screen. Here. Let's share. That's good. I did right now. Here. Turn on the focus. It's this. So people aren't giving me. 
going to do is screen two, maybe. All right, can everyone see my screen here? Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So this is, uh, these are, uh, you know, the assets that um, that came with the pack here. Uh, and I've gone and I wanted to play with a bunch of the new 426 stuff because I'm a tech artist. It's kind of what I do is I take the new stuff and I hammer it until it breaks. Um, and then I try and make it so it's not so easy to break anymore. Uh, so I wanted to take a ton of the stuff, uh, new lighting stuff, old lighting stuff, combine it together, kind of see if these assets work well with all of these different kinds of uh, techniques and, and make sure that they, they fit well uh, kind of within the ecosystem and the way I'd use them um, because I can, I can change them if I don't like them. Uh, so uh, I built this little level here and you can probably tell I'm using a bunch of the new 426 water and terrain features. Um, if you haven't been playing with 426 or following along, um, there's a whole new set of terrain features called landmass and a whole new water system. The water system is experimental, um, so you shouldn't really use it in production at all, and we'll see why <laughs> shortly. Uh, it's very experimental, but it's beautiful looking. Um, he, was the water then, system built from Fortnite? It is. Fire this call? is the water oh. system uh, from Fortnite, actually. Uh, so we built this and and the the terrain system as well so uh, we looked at how we were building terrains and sculpting them and um, we wanted to make it not bad because um, it was kind of not good uh, so we <laughs> we worked on that a lot and and the two things that we've got really are we've got layers now so when you're sculpting your terrain and painting it they're all on layers like you would expect and you can relayer them and turn them on and off and change their alpha. And so it's totally non-destructive, which is great. Uh, and then the other are these landscape brushes, which are blueprints that can change the way the landscape is built up. Uh, and those make such a huge difference for, for gameplay because um, instead of having to sculpt your terrain to fit your gameplay, you've got just kind of actors that you can move around to change plateaus or ramps or whatever they are. And again, it's totally non-destructive. So if you like, get rid of the, the lake. You can just delete the lake and the lake is gone. Uh, and you don't have to, you know, do the million things to rectify that, that design decision. Um, so uh, I started and was just playing around with all this stuff uh started sculpting out this this little half moon level and i wanted to kind of imagine building a level where you land uh on a desert island and you have to cross over the water and come up here and solve some puzzles to you know unlock this building up here to unlock your flight power to go up into the clouds etc um and it gave me a chance to use a bunch of a bunch of those features and so um, what I've got here, as far as content, is really just the asset pack. And then I went to the vehicle game, uh, which is a, a game that's in the learn tab on the launcher. Uh, and I grabbed the the uh, I grabbed this this palm tree from there because I was like, "Ooh, that's a nice animated palm tree. I like it." And I grabbed the the uh, terrain material because I needed something to start with. Uh, and I made some modifications so it doesn't look all photo real and fancy like it does in the game. And I matched it with the, the color sampler to these are the islands. Um, so I took the islands and and I wish I could say I invented this, but I'm not really a level person. Um, but uh, I think either Seven showed me this or uh, someone on the team showed me this, that we can take the islands, flip them, and now we have rocks that look exactly like the islands for some nice... Uh, consistency. Um, and it's a really good way when you're working with terrains to kind of add some uh, variation to the terrain and, you know, give it some some polygon edges because, you know, these landscapes are really soft. Uh, and so you can really kind of make things a little more visually interesting uh, by breaking up those edges because, you know, if we remove this sort of stuff, 
uh, you know, it's 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 pretty boring under there. I used some erosion tools and they looked ugly too. So I just hit them. Um, and so, yeah, I've, uh, I've been playing with the character and a bunch of the like physics stuff. And uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll press play here. The last thing I was working on was these floating platforms. Um, and you can see right away they're they're not exactly what I want. And then it gets worse from there as soon as I try and jump on one. It just, <laughs> it's not working at all. And then they all just start, it gets worse. They just fly. And uh, it's, it's not what I expected. But And then they kind of work as expected. Um, but then uh -huh. they don't. So <laughs> uh, I think... I think Tom, me and someone actually, on the physics team have to, uh, and someone has to walk me through the finer points of the buoy bu buoyancy. I can't pronounce that one. The buoyancy component, um, but it's it's almost there. I just want to be able to stand on it and have it like make me fall off and stuff. But um, but this uh, is the sort of thing that like as as someone who's learning and wanting to experiment with stuff, I wanted to experiment with the water system and the buoyancy thing. And what you know, you're I don't is... want to have to go build all of this junk and build a, a piece of wood. By the way, like this is actually the wall piece. Ah. Um, this is one of the, the clever things that we came no up with. No wonder it doesn't was... work. You can't use a that? wall. No it's wonder it doesn't rock. work. It can't float. It's a, it's, it's a... it's exactly... Why didn't I think of that? That's actually... This is, these are all movie props. This is all just foam anyway, oh, so yeah. it totally floats. Didn't but, you see the way they were floating? Yes. What you're oh, really saying like. is that Ryan Brooks wouldn't take your call to fix that. That's <laughs> possibly what I'm saying is that over Christmas break, I couldn't get Ryan <laughs> Ryan was like, that. it's Tom again. Again for, <laughs> for the stream. And he wants to do what? If you can't do it in Fortnite, you're not doing it. Uh, the, the the buoyancy components and all of the, the water system, like I said, is an experimental right now. Um, so uh, it's it's got some some rough edges and like the interfaces and everything for it will change. Um, but currently, it's actually pretty cool. The way you set yep. this up is once you turn on water, which is just a plug in you turn on um, and then you get these water actors that show up. Um, it's almost too easy. You just type in water and you get all your water types um this you know it's an ocean here and there's a lake with a river and they all mm -hmm. blend together it's, it's almost... again there's a big tutorial that um, shore did on the whole system mm -hmm. which is great fun to watch and they're very kind of similar -ish. except just looks better oh, no, I'm, yours I'm is okay lovely i'm okay with that because <laughs> that's short um so yeah, so I just built, uh, it's really simple. It's just a, a you know, a, a static mesh uh, with, with physics turned on. And then you have this buoyancy component that you add. So when you turn on the water plugin, you get this buoyancy component. And then it starts to get a little weird. You actually have to set up pontoons. So there are virtual pontoons on each corner of this. And that's what makes it float. Um, so, um, I have a feeling that what's happening now is that my character is like 400 kilograms and this platform weighs one because that was how I got it to float. And so when I touch it with my super heavy, not floaty character, it just, mm. so, you know, eventually I'll figure this out, but um, that's the kind of stuff I love to do with this, you know, and, and I could do this with just a box in a plain level, but that's not fun for me. I don't want to look at that all day long. I've looked at that for three years in Manny. Bring on the color. <laughs> Bring on some blues and some other stuff. Uh, but so there's um, some other stuff here I'll show you there. The buoyancy does work uh, for some other stuff. Here. Whoa. You've, you've customized what did I do? Your, <gasps> you're walking on the air. It's almost like a Christmas song. Um, I, I think I was walking on Central. All right. So I'm going to fly over here and over here i've got these are little our little balls from in there uh, and if you knock them into the river they actually float right down the river as expected so when buoyancy works it's pretty oh i missed the river Score. you gotta play more fifa there we go 
So you can imagine that you could build a puzzle where you have to, you know, fill up a thing with so many, uh, so many cool. balls, and, or they have to go through a gate, or you have to free the little fishy guys, or all sorts of fun little kind of gameplay. You should write a lesson there. plan. Do that. Uh, yeah, here's our character flying about. Um, so also I played with the, the like I was saying, we've got these terrain brushes. So I went in into landscape now. Uh, this is where we can start editing this. And uh, right here are my layers. So I've got, you know, you can actually see where I've gone and added it, edited, added some, some extra. I needed the player to be able to get up here because I was playing it and was like, oh, my player can't get up to the river. Maybe I should modify that. And so I went in and just sculpted out a little modification right there. Um, and if I didn't like it, I could just go right back really easily. I even change the alpha of it. So it's like, I want it like halfway in there. Uh, first time. Uh, and even the water comes in as a kind of interesting layer, which I'm trying to quite figure out hmm. here. But yeah, so the water and these islands are all built using these landscape brushes that modify the terrain so uh so i'm gonna go shift one and then i can select my river here and i can take these points and just move them about and when i do it'll recalculate the water on the fly that's cool Ooh, that's, not, that's not nice i can even change the uh you know just totally make a water slide out of it and then i'm just going in and uh and I, and I've learned that I can fly up here because fly just lets you slide up things. And now our river has this much more. And you can see here's, you know, I'm trying to avoid a scene that, that keeps showing up there, ignore this scene and the man behind the curtain. Uh, but yeah, I mean, super easy to go make gameplay changes or, or fix whatever. Um, it's it's really wild how much easier that is. Uh, this whole island is shaped with these brushes. Um, this is then I'm using so much the new, easier. The new uh, the new sky capture, so that all the lighting in here is fully dynamic. Uh, I'm using if I come over to our various stuff here. Our directional light is uh, feeding the skylight here. Let me just make sure. That yeah, there's such a real time capture. So as I move our directional light, make some really dramatic changes to the lighting. <laughs> there's some cloud shadows. That's totally intentional. Uh, but yeah, I can very easily, really dramatically change the look uh, of everything. Uh, wow. There's some interesting shadow cutoff issues here that I'll work on later. Uh, it's never quite that easy, especially once you do a performance pass and then you move the main light. Some, some stuff looks weird, uh, but easy enough to fix. Um, and you can see, go back. Um, and this is, you know, this is, so what I've done here is really, really simple to get this effect is um, in my project settings, I went and turned on mesh distance fields, generate mesh distance fields. I wanted to see did these meshes that we built work, and they do, they work awesomely. They're built exactly how mesh distance field wants to work. Um, and so you turn that on, you open your project again, and for every mesh in your level, Unreal will generate this mesh distance field, which is essentially a 3D texture representation of the mesh that we can use to do kind of, kind of ray tracing ish effects. Um, and so what we're doing in the scene right now is we're using that to do the ambient occlusion from our skylight. So uh, this, all the ambient occlusion we're seeing here is being generated using those uh, those mesh distance fields. And so um, what this means is that our ambient occlusion really works. So when you're outside, we're seeing a lot of that sunlight and it's really bright. And when we look inside, the insides are dark. 
Um, and this is one of those things that when you see it like this, you're like, yeah, that's the way it should work. Um, but this is how normal uh, ambient occlusion looks. So, oh wait, that's the wrong light. <laughs> this one, this is how normal ambient. But you can see that this wall inside here is the same color as this wall outside here. Now, when we turn that on, we have a much darker interior. And, and even when we move inside, it's much, much more obvious that we're inside and we're getting that nice kind of overexposure of the outside that we're always looking for is being able to see inside. But when we look out, it's a little blown out until we look through the window and the exposure. Change. So if we don't have that, if we're, if we have just consistent lighting through everything, we can never really achieve that. So mesh distance fields give us that in real time. So then the other thing you can see right now is that we've I've turned on a new, is it beta experimental? Um, oops, not a plugin. Again, in the project settings, it's called screen space global illumination. So it's past experimental, it's in beta, which for us means it's not going to change a lot, but it's maybe not up to, up to the performance, or there might be some a couple of rough edges. Please let us know, and we'll fix them uh, in, in future releases. But we're at, once it reaches beta, we're like, this is good to go. We want to use it. Other people can use it. And what's cool is this just turns on and off. Check this out. What? Sorry, I was doing console stuff earlier apparently and now i have to do this manually so normally if you're not a nerd like me and i've been using console commands this would just work uh, so if i just turn off screen space global illumination that's where we're at so not only does it provide global illumination but it provides an even better ambient occlusion uh, in screen space so this is like traditional screen space uh, ambient occlusion and then we can even turn off our, so this is kind of like, I think how most students and most people, when they first start building with dynamic lighting outdoors, it looks okay. It's passable, looks, looks pretty nice actually. Uh, but you start getting into the nitty gritty and you make a cave or you make an interior and you're like, uh, it's, so it's really blue in here. Um, and so these two things are in 426 now and literally you turn on mesh distance field turn on your uh, screen space uh, global illumination, which we'll turn back on here, because wow. Um, and then we'll turn it on, and that is such a huge difference. Uh, and it's worth noting too, like if I bring up the performance, you know, this scene is not like super slow, because everyone I know is going, what's the actual frame rate? Uh, and I'm well over 60, off. <laughs> I'm running on it, on a much better card than 70. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I had to. Um, but it's, you know, it like we said, you know, I've just turned on like all the all the render features. I've got full dynamic GI and ambient occlusion, and I'm in a 60 frame uh per second budget, uh, you know, well within that that limitation. So uh, these are things that you can start learning and teaching right now. Um, and this is the setup I really recommend for people who are doing large open worlds are just kind of starting to learn because you don't have to bake um, and everything is really, really easy and, and fast. You know, if I decided I wanted this wall to be gone, I can just delete it. Lighting will truly update. Wow. So it's because I'm live, right? I'm gonna do this. Whoa. Who broke my skylight? Uh, hello, Skylight. Did I delete uh, well, my Skylight? Well, you do. Oh, that, I did I delete my Skylight. <laughs> it's because I, I deleted that. my Skylight along with it. And that is how you change your lighting. Aha! So now I've opened it up, and you can see the lighting changes really significantly. And this would change at runtime too. So if you had your players destroying walls, the lighting can change, which is really really cool. So yeah, this is this kind of the stuff that I, when I get really high quality assets, I love to just kind of push stuff. And I love that these are not overwrought. They're not a bazillion triangles. So when I'm 
turning on mesh distance fields, it doesn't take six hours for it to count. It took like five minutes for it to do its thing. Um, you know, the materials are simple. So when I make a material change, it's not, you know, a 10 minute recompile of some crazy shader graph. Everything is, is really, really, it, someone said it, quick wins. You get those quick mm -hmm. wins and, you know, I'm not, I'm not looking to, to fight against the, the content that I'm working with. I just want to put it in there and, and, and test this stuff out to see, does it work? So what, what's its performance like? And that's life of a tech artist. Give us a recap, Tom, because I think that's really valuable. So you've got your direction light is fully dynamic. So uh, that is a movable dynamic light. And that is a is it is a movable skylight as well? Yep. So all my lights are all set to movable. Okay. And then you've uh, got so I've got a, a movable directional. Right. Uh, and the only thing that's set on here, you know, I've set, you know, I've done some some so art. You got temperature art on direction. You got some temperature. Uh, I turn on. temperature on. You know, I like yeah. I like to add that. So you got some warmth. intensity, and you get the liberty of using those tools for art direction. And yeah. And, and then you know I, yeah, I made bloom. it look kind of pretty. I, yeah. I put a kind of weird purple tint on it to give yeah. it an otherworldliness. Um, but otherwise, the only thing that I've really changed here, uh, yeah, is in, now in four twenty six. This used to hide down here under light, right here, and I'm so used to looking for it. So you've but I've set it, it up as the atmosphere light. Yeah, you attached um, and that it. now has its own section there you here go. because. Now our lighting has a whole atmosphere cloud thing that it didn't before. So it's but really all I've done is I've turned on that it's our atmosphere light. Yeah. And that informs the atmosphere system that the light should be coming from this direction. So it's come it's um, attached. And the other to the thing fall. it does is really cool is it will actually tint the color of the sun right. based on its angle and all of Perfect. that. So once you turn that on, it's like welcome, welcome to the system. Um, I've got an exponential height fog, mm -hmm. which does have volumetric fog turned on. There's your volumetric. Um, and it's not so much for the fog here, but it's for this effect Interior, that I did yeah. here, which I don't know that we much time to get into. But again, I wanted to make, I was like, ooh, I saw this, this gym thing, and I wanted to make a cool volumetric uh, lighting effect for it. So this is actually a volume texture on a cube um, that you could just kind of move. Uh, with the volumetric system, it renders and you can go into it. You know, it's not made of planes and all of that. It's actually like cool volumetric, which I love. I love that stuff. It's so cool. Um, so yeah, so the uh, get back to there exponential height fog with volumetric fog turned on. I think that's like all I changed other than, you know, art direction y stuff. Um, I'll get to the post process volume in a sec. I have our sky atmosphere, which is our new sky atmosphere system. And this is what takes the angle of the sun and changes the sky. And you just drop that in and this yep. is what you get. Hello. <laughs> Easy peasy. Uh, and then we have our skylight. In the skylight, a couple of things are changed. I've changed it. I've turned on real-time capture. And real-time capture only captures and it shows here, it only captures sky atmosphere, volumetric cloud components, and anything that you have with a sky material. So in your material editor, you can say, this is sky, and it'll render in here. And that's how it can render in real time, is that it's not rendering your whole scene like the traditional one did. So it won't be one-to-one, -one, but hey, real-time lighting, love it. And I made it brighter. Um, and I added some lower hemisphere bounce because I wanted these islands to look a little glowy. I think maybe they're a little overdone that way. This is PBR lighting, uh, but you know, we get to art direct. See people. So um, uh, real quick then, question, quick question. When uh, you cast shadows is turned on and that's turned on by default. And that's how you toggle the, the uh, ambient occlusion skylight. And then I haven't made any changes, I don't think. Uh, but you can change the distance field ambient occlusion settings in your skylight rather than your post-process volume. So you don't get any extra bounces or you don't get to manipulate any extra bounces from your skylight when you are using this type of skylight, right? It's, uh, right. it's all one ambient bounce. occlusion. Okay. Yep. So yeah, the skylight won't really... 
it kind of creeps in, but you can uh, you can push your occlusion to really uh, to really clamp it out if you want. Okay. And then really you, art direction style. You get mesh distance fields turned on, which is gonna. Uh, that's that's the key to getting this effect is turning on the mesh distance fields in your project setting. Which is a project restart to recompile while your shaders everyone should be aware of. Actually, I don't know that it uh, might recompile shaders. <laughs> but it, when I turned it on with this pack, like I said, it was super painless. Um, I didn't have to go like, for a coffee break to do it because the 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 more geometry you have the longer this process takes so if you're taking you know a quixel asset and bringing it in and it's got 14 million triangles it takes a while but um one of these you know thousand triangle objects it can generate it super quick so yeah you turn that on um and then when you drop in a skylight it will uh, a dynamic skylight, it'll automatically be turned on by default, in fact. So that's without it and with it. And then the the last thing is the screen space global illumination, which mm -hmm. is, and you can just type in SSGI, by the way, because someone was nice. Put that, that hook in, you turn that on. Um, and normally you'll see that turn on right away in your viewport if you haven't toggled it. Um, and so that one though, that is controlled by your post-process volume. So this one took me a minute to figure out because when I first turned it on, I was like, I don't really see it. Um, but that is, if you look, there's a global illumination section under your post-process volume and it defaults to one which is pretty good, but I like to pump it up like four. You can see with it off, you actually get this really nice ambient occlusion uh, without, uh, without the bounce. So if you just want this better ambient occlusion, that's how you get there. Um, and it, it, it is actually a much nicer AO uh, than you normally get. One and then which of course eats away into the AO. So it's a balance between stuff being grounded and uh, uh, kind of that bounce light. But, so yeah, I mean, in 426 right now, you can start building these, you know, really, really pretty dynamic worlds. It's not quite lumen. You're not getting any bounces. You're not getting, you know, a bunch of, uh, you know, it, it, it has some really hard limitations, <laughs> uh, but it's, uh, it's 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 getting there and you can you can start kind of getting used to working in a fully dynamic lighting environment just really quickly your directional light you have to tell it that it's using uh um mesh distance fields so you can um you can have it cast shadows using mesh distance fields so you can see under here there's distance field shadows and the way i'm using it right now is how we use it in fortnite actually is up close, we're using regular cascaded shadows, and I'll show you over here why. Because when we're up close, we want our trees to low in the wind. But we can cast shadows from mesh distance fields, which are actually much cheaper to, to cast than these shadows, but they, um, they don't move. So you can see here that mm. one, our terrain, mm -hmm. at least I haven't figured out how to get it to cast the mesh distance field shadow. And uh, anything else, you'll see the shadow does two things. It goes to half resolution. So if you're looking really closely, you can see some pixelization there. Um, and it doesn't move. Um, and so by having it blend uh, fairly early, we can get really nice shadows up close that don't take a ton of performance. Because I think I only have those set to render out Yes, get a shot. They're only rendering out 5,000 units rather mm -hmm. than like the usual like 20,000 or whatever you have to push it. We're using distance field shadow. So if you put dynamic shadow field down to zero, you'll just get the distance field shadows, um, which work, but there's some problems there too. Characters don't cast shadows easily, and there's some other stuff. So not 
not totally recommended unless you're a real pioneer. <laughs> so I still use, uh, you know, my dynamic shadows up close, and then I transition over to the distance field shadow. For cool. Sense. Yeah. Um, and yeah, like I said, you know, if I if I do a, a performance reading on here, it's really not bad. See each one of these things. There's volume fog. Here's uh, the ambient occlusion, which you can see. This is the, or I'm sorry, the uh, screen space GI. Um, lights, skylight. Uh, this is our single, single layer water shader that we're using now and post processing. So, you know, all of the, the, uh, the fancy rendering features barely kind of show up as a blip. So you could, render at this high quality at a crazy frame rate on especially next gen consoles i mean this would run it a billion frames a second on a ps5 or a series x really really cool stuff that's fantastic a uh, quick question came in from darcifier asking about the difference between project settings and editor settings and being a bit unsure as to um why you would change things in a project setting versus the editor setting. So editor tends to be your editor interface um, and it's kind of personal stuff. So like I wanna change uh, color of the main window. Where is that, there it is. Because I like horrible green toolbars. Uh, that won't affect anyone else on my team. Uh, so all of this stuff is stuff that is personal to you, how you like your, your viewport set up, uh, your sprite editors, all of this stuff. Um, so stuff that won't impact the project, whereas project settings are the settings that will impact everyone else on the team and actually change how the project works. And it used to be, is it now that editor settings are stored with, some editor settings are stored with the editor, like your, your layout gets stored in the editor, um, but this, uh, like this customization gets stored on a per project basis. So I used to think it was where they were stored, but it's more philosophical apparently, as far as I know, if you trust that, Tom. So if you're working on, uh, you know, Fortnite, your project, your Fortnite project is affected by you changing the project settings. Whereas if you went and modified your hotkeys and right. your editor, that's not going to affect Fortnite. Yeah. If So you modify those editor preferences, you still have a job. You modified the project settings on Fortnite. That might be in question. <laughs> you better not check that into Perforce. <laughs> not me. One, two, three, not it. We yeah, are coming. It's, it's, uh, this is so much fun. I'm, that I'm was, so happy that, was that amazing. this is out there. So. Yep, that was amazing. Um, yeah. We are uh, sort of coming towards the end of the stream. If you guys uh, out there uh, have some questions that we didn't get to for Seven, uh, for Mark and for I think Tom. Th there were some questions for Seven about... Um, possibly putting the resources in the R of co code um, repository rather than just in um, Epic Games. Is that going to happen? Yeah, so we've, uh, we've been talking with the R of code people. They like us quite a bit, um, and we like them. Uh, just this year, things happened. Um, just timing didn't work out. But the hope is basically for future years, heck yeah, uh, mm -hmm. moving forward. Yeah. Are you saying that that effort got a little 2020 would <laughs> Is that going to yes. be what we say about things going foobar from now on? Yeah. And what will we do for things that are late in 2021? <laughs> yeah, in 2022, so, buddy. you know, there are some people that are asking for a badge for this. Uh, discussions yeah, I think about that's a badge. A fabulous idea. Mm. Uh, yeah. So, so right now, um, uh, unfortunately, we do not have a badge set up for this, but we are uh, talking and the hope is kind of, you know, next iteration that we can 
put this on the online learning so that there we can have badges associated with it. Um, I, so I think it should be an enchilada or a croissant. Mm -hmm. Good plan. Submit your, croissant. Submit your badge uh, design ideas to UE Academia at epicgames.com. <laughs> <laughs> cruel what a cruel person <laughs> that's forwarding to you now right i'll take i'll take all the you know ask the uh, my email what's the contact email for the hour of code stuff and so i've received a lot of emails oh. asking for v bucks <laughs> <laughs> a, a lot of a lot of awesome emails from educators that are using the content and they're super pleased about it. And then just from, I've gotten a few messages, just, just asking for V bucks, just people shooting their shot, you know? Hey, it's the worst that can happen. <laughs> <laughs> Russian hackers is the worst that can happen. Apparently. But <laughs> <laughs> 20 is the worst that can happen. <laughs> Well, uh, anyway, yeah, it looks so cool. You I'm know, go out and looking get forward it. to seeing what people make with it. Download it, use it. Um, you know, hopefully that uh, we uh, are going to share a survey. You know, for today's stream, uh, let us know what you thought. Uh, let us know what you think. Let us know how you feel. Uh, it's only five questions, so uh, but with a nice big section where you can tell us. Uh, that you loved it, you know, or liked it a lot, or, you know, that uh, you learned many things and that you like enchiladas <laughs> and that that you don't mind Manny as much as Seven minds Manny. <laughs> <laughs> or if you do, write that. If you agree with me, also definitely put that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we thank you very much for joining us on today's stream. Uh, thank you, Tom. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Seven. And thank you all for joining us in, in, on our very first Tuesday stream. I'm going to put up the survey. Um, so you can access the survey for today's stream by either using your telephone and taking a picture of our delightful, um, whatever that thing is in the middle, QR code, or you can go to uh, hourofcode.questionpro.com and it's only five questions. So just um, say hello and uh, let us know if you enjoyed the content today. Um, we will be back again next Tuesday uh, with a stream on the Unreal Fellowship, um, which for those of you who have been paying attention, uh, we've been doing a fellowship um, on virtual production, which has been uh, really very popular. And the curriculum, uh, the Brian Poole, who has been developing the curriculum for the Unreal Fellowship, will join us on the stream and talk about um, developing the curriculum for uh, all the people that have gone through it. So that should be really interesting. We'll, we'll actually get a chance to um, take a look at a lot of the outcomes from that, and that'll be really exciting. And... We've got some uh, additional cool streams coming up. So, yeah, Tuesdays, Tuesdays, Tuesdays. Join us. Happy Tuesdays. New Year. Yes. Happy 2021. Taco Tuesday. So Taco Tuesday. Taco Tuesday. Taco Tuesday. Taco Tuesday. I knew there was something, some reason why this all. <laughs> mm. Educator enchiladas and Taco Tuesday. Mm. All right. But Your alliteration is alluring. <laughs> thank you all once again for joining us and we hope you stay safe and uh we'll see you next time bye guys thanks bye everyone stay safe bye everyone bye